My father's in town. Now, I love my dad, but like most men, particularly those who grew up with their father mostly not present, and even many who grew up with their father present, we have a complicated relationship as adults. As I said, I love the man, but I also harbor a deep resentment, even rage, that really I know now just covers over a profound sadness that may never be healed. In fact, I believe the way I've lived my entire life, particularly as an adult, has been shaped by my roller coaster relationship with my overwhelmingly absent father. And in some ways that surely have served me well, such as my endless drive to accomplish whatever I set my mind to because I know no one else is going to step in and do things for me. But yet in other ways that have been just utterly debilitating, such as my endless pursuit of some measure of success that has eluded me and I know will continue to elude me forever. Have you struggled to feel successful enough? Have you struggled in relationship when you were professionally unfulfilled? And did you know that a dad's essential gift to a child is to instill both the drive to succeed and the understanding that you're already always successful? Well, in this episode, I mine these questions and more for useful insights to make a meaningful difference in your life. Today, I dive into one of my recent popular blogs, A Man Without a Father's Praise Never Feels Successful Enough. My dad is a brilliant man. He's a man who spent the last 40 years of his life working alongside my stepmother to make energy medicine technologies into real and viable products that we can use to help the human body heal and thrive. These technologies aren't too far off from the kind of thing you'd see in a sci-fi TV show like Star Trek. And I worked with them back in 2003 to help grow one of their signature products into a $50 million company. Oprah Winfrey loved that product and featured it twice on her famous Favorite Things audience giveaway shows in both 2003 and 2005. She even invited us onto her show to talk about this technology. And when our public relations spokesperson completely miffed on one of Oprah's questions in front of a live audience, I immediately stepped in. I, I practically grabbed the, the boom mic dangling over our heads, and I spent the next few minutes talking to Oprah about mind-body energy science on her show. You know, how our thoughts and feelings can affect the rhythm and beat of, our, of the hearts in our chests and how we're all connected to our environments and to each other through invisible electromagnetic fields that have real impact on us. And I know this all may sound a bit woo-woo, and to some degree the science of it all still is. But I'll tell you this, in the words of our vice president of the company who was sitting right next to me that day on the Oprah show, and whose primary character trait was to be a shrewd observer of everything, Oprah was enraptured by my words. After the show, I spent another few minutes backstage talking with Oprah. And you can see the picture of us that was taken that day. It's on my website on my story page. On our way back to the hotel, that cold day in Chicago, I'll never forget, our vice president told me that she was going to make me the international spokesperson for our company. Now, this was something I had no training for because up until that point, I'd mostly spent working on other aspects of this nascent business. As the technology research director for the company, responsible for researching the efficacy and effects of this product, I worked with the Miami Dolphins football team for almost a year. They had agreed to let us study how our product impacted the performance of their players. I also served as the head of customer service, building up our customer service department essentially from nothing. Oprah featured our product just six months after we launched. Now, especially in those days, when Oprah featured your product on her show before you were ready for big sales numbers and before you had a customer service department, well, it was too late to get ready. Building that customer service department, even as Oprah promoted it, was like trying to build a house in the middle of a hurricane. I would work 16-hour days at the office for months to ensure that our exploding customer base had the care and concern they deserved. And then when our VP made me international spokesperson after the Oprah show, I would spend the next few years jet-setting all over the world doing magazine and TV interviews in dozens of countries in multiple language. 
I once set foot on four continents in seven days teaching people about our product. And who knows how many of our product I helped sell. And I know that I helped turn thousands of potentially frustrated customers into happy ones. Yet despite my basically heroic contributions to the company, as well as other roles that I played in helping make that small family business into a $50 million success in less than five years, I have no recollection of my dad, one of the principal owners and therefore benefactors of the company's success, ever acknowledging my contributions to the experience. Now maybe he did, and surely he must have said something at some point, but I have no memory of it. What I do have is more memory of his criticisms, his unasked for directions about how I should be doing things. Now, this isn't a podcast in which I'm gonna hate on my dad, no. That is definitely not the point. I have no intention of hating on my dad. He is a good man with a good heart. You'll also notice I'm not mentioning what the product was. And I don't want to get into that because shortly before I left the company in 2008, my dad one day suddenly fired my then girlfriend who was working for us. It was an act of betrayal like none I'd ever experienced. In fact, on that day, my father's action awoke in me an anger I didn't even imagine possible. And when I confronted him at his home the next day, my stepmother on the other side of the house said the whole world shook because of my anger. He and I weren't able to see eye to eye that day, and I left the company not long after. And not long after I left the company, their business partners essentially stole the company from them. It was a heartbreaking ordeal that took my dad and my stepmom years to get over. And me and my dad ourselves are still healing from that painful time. And my dad does have a very good heart. He genuinely wants to be of service to humanity. And even at 75, he's nowhere near quitting on his mission to bring energy medicine technology to humanity. My dad also never got much praise and acknowledgement from his dad. If anything, his own dad, and definitely his brothers, were way more critical than supportive of his own efforts to live a good life and do good work. And I know that hurt my dad deeply. And it affected the way he oriented towards me, his only son. And how his overwhelming absence of acknowledgement towards me has affected my own orientation towards myself and towards everything else in life. And that's what today's episode is really about. So take a deep breath and stay present with me all the way through to my three key takeaways at the end of this episode of Men This Way. All right, let's dive. A man without a father's praise never feels successful enough. The more fragile a man feels internally, the more likely he is to try building an outer shell to hide this fragility. The author Guy Corneau said that in the book, Absent Fathers, Lost Sons. Again, the more fragile a man feels internally, the more likely he is to try building an outer shell to hide this fragility. Throughout my life, I have been plagued by the enduring fear that I'm never quite successful enough, whatever my actual success is which has been at times a kind of torture for every woman I ever tried to love. For I have tragically sacrificed love over and over again on the raging pyres of an endless and futile pursuit of some ultimate success that nonetheless refuses to reveal itself. No matter how bright the burn of my sacrificial fires, that final success I've hunted has only ever persisted to lurk stubborn in the dark shadows just beyond light's edge. I know now it wasn't some ultimate external success I was seeking, but rather the enduring and unassailable peace of mind I hoped it would bring. Since diving into men's inner growth work a decade ago, and through coaching hundreds of other men along the way, I've discovered a profound connection between the enduring absence of a man's peace of mind and the enduring absence of praise from a father, or any male elder's praise. This is a boy without a man's presence. 
My dad mostly stopped paying attention to me when I was four years old. Not because he was somehow a bad father. That was simply my age when he and my mom ended their turbulent marriage, and he moved out, and mostly on forever. Though he stayed in touch and I saw him occasionally throughout my youth, the immense void of his daily presence brought with it an immense absence of masculine energy guidance and praise from an elder man, the very thing a boy requires to become himself. Or I should say the very thing a boy requires to become a man himself. Robert Moore and Douglas Gillette said in their seminal book on masculine psychology, King, Warrior, Magician, Lover, that a man who cannot get it together is a man who has probably not had the opportunity to undergo ritual initiation into the deep structures of manhood. He remains a boy, not because he wants to, but because no one has shown him the way to transform his boy energies into man energies. I like so many grown men who remain psychologically adolescent well into adulthood throughout my 20s and 30s, even into my 40s. I ached deeply for a wise elder man's guidance, for his blessing and benediction into my own manhood. I just never knew it. I wouldn't have admitted it anyway. So angry was I at being left alone by men to find my own way. For when a boy grows up without the consistent presence of an elder male, father-like figure, he grows up believing he's on his own. A physically present but emotionally distant or abusive man is not present for the boy. A wise elder woman, for example a mom, no matter how loving, can't show a boy the way into becoming a mature man. She can surely teach him many essential things, like how a woman expects to be treated by a man but she can't model manhood for him, not in the body where he most needs to learn about being man. When I was 10, two curious events happened that clearly reveal the effect of his absence on me, emotionally, physically, mentally, and the lifelong consequences that followed. One, the first event happened at a soccer game. While I played in hundreds of organized sports league games throughout my youth, my dad only came to two and both were disasters for me. In soccer, I'd been a star forward, one of the highest scorers in the league, until the day my dad showed up. On that day, acutely aware, of my absent, uh, acutely aware that my absent father was watching me from the sidelines, I suddenly felt as though my body had been unplugged from some cosmic electrical socket, as all the energy had been drained from my 10-year-old body. During a climactic moment on the field with the ball at my feet, the goal suddenly opened up before me, and instead of striking a decisive rocket shot into the back of the net, my limp little legs could barely muster a weak toe tap on the ball, which sent it rolling gently, timidly, along the ground towards the goalie, who scooped it up easily like he was simply picking up his own pet. I'd never felt so viscerally incapacitated, physically incapable of so-called success. And the second disaster happened at a, ba a baseball game. It was very similar. I was the starting pitcher that day. And my dad showed up and volunteered to be the home plate umpire, as many dads may do at their kids' games. And I took the mound and looked towards home plate where I saw my absent father's eyes staring directly back at me from behind the shadowy black grill of the umpire's mask. But this time he was no mere spectator. He was specifically charged with judging my every toss of the ball in his direction. Did I throw a good pitch? Success. Or a bad one? Failure. My dad alone would decide. And the game and my fragile masculine worthiness would hang in his balance. Again, I felt paralyzed. The electrical umbilical cords supplying energy to my boy body ripped from its source. Instead of fastballs straight over the plate, my listless pitching arm could only offer soft, high-arcing lobs that soared high over the heads of both batter and father judge. A few pitches in, Dad stopped the game, flipped up his mask of menace, and asked for help from both coaches. He didn't know how to call my softball pitches in this baseball game. I don't recall whether my dad reassured and praised me at either game. He may have. Again, he may have. But what I do recall viscerally in my body 
was my shame to f- at failing to perform. I also recall an overwhelming sadness at knowing he wasn't likely to attend any more games. I didn't openly express my emotions on either day. I didn't know how. Yet my impotent performance revealed it all. It's just that no one was present enough to notice. And since then, there was never a convincing voice in my head reassuring me that I'm a successful man, a worthy man. Women would often reassure me I'm a good man, yet that was never suitable substitute for the blessing of a wise, trustable, elder man. And on a side note, since then, I've been having a recurring dream, and I didn't actually even realize that I was having this recurring dream until my partner Sylvie, a few months, let me six months ago, started reading a book on dreams, the psychology of dreams. I've had vivid dreams my entire life. I've been a, a very vivid dreamer, and I remember most of my dreams. So, but I didn't put it together that I'd had a recurring dream, and it was a recurring dream of being on a soccer field. The details are always a little bit different. Sometimes there's more players, less players. Uh, sometimes there's celebrities on the field. A couple weeks ago, it was, I was playing soccer with Vladimir Putin. He was on the other team. But the, the dream is always the same. The ball is at my feet, and I can't muster power to kick the ball. The path to the goal is clear, but I can't. My, my, there's no energy in my legs. And when I go to kick it, even though I can see, I can feel, I just have the vision of how to kick the ball into the goal, all I can muster is a weak little toe tap that barely has any energy to it. And the goalie always blocks it with b- minimal difficulty. It's incredibly frustrating and it's that feeling of impotence all over again. Now, in the last few years, as I've been doing more of my inner growth work, particularly around healing my relationship to masculinity with, and healing my relationship with my father, there have been times when I've actually put the, goal, uh, put the ball finally in the goal. I have yet to have a satisfying you know, boot into the back of the net, but I have been able to score uh, in various ways, um, usually with the help of a teammate, uh, in these in these recurring dreams, and the feeling in my body is one of elation and power, even though I'm still uh, somewhat hampered by this this feeling of impotence. So it's been fascinating to track the evolution of that dream as I've grown aware of it uh, along my own journey to to healing my relationship with both masculine energy and my relationship to my father. A boy can only receive meaningful affirmation of his manhood from the men already wholly living inside their own. And thus was my journey, like so many men, that in the absence of an elder man's wisdom and guidance, I too often felt rudderless, powerless, lost, adrift in the vast oceans of my life, unable to feel deeply successful for more than rare fleeting moments. Without a better model of manhood, I naturally defaulted to popular culture's half-baked ideals. You know, a real man is a moneymaker who dominates on the field, in the bedroom, and in the boardroom, whose only permissible emotion is anger, which he uses to get his way. But I didn't trust these shallow ideals, and few men genuinely do. Most of us see them as faint shadows at best of far more profound and expansive truths about our nature. So while I looked outwardly successful, money, women, impact, I felt utterly unworthy of it all, endlessly hungry, always craving for more. Without a wise elder man that I trusted, regularly reassuring me that I'm inherently successful, good enough, loved, worthy as I am, regardless the size of my bank account or number of notches on my bedpost or whether I win or lose, I only knew to keep seeking fulfillment by exploiting the world around me, which is the best way to never finding fulfillment. For when one can't feel successful within their own being, no external accomplishment will ever satisfy. When one can't generate true generosity within their own thoughts, they'll always see strings attached to the generosity of others. When one can't connect to the profound love in their own heart, They won't trust the love of anyone else. 
This is how a lack of masculine fulfillment destroys intimacy. Without the capacity to feel deeply successful, loved, and worthy of love, my intimate partnerships suffered greatly. For when a woman dared express upset towards me in some moment of her hurting, she was rarely met with my empathy or understanding. Instead, she would find herself pressed right up against the cold stone walls of my indifference and my anger, built strong and sky high to keep hidden, mostly from myself, my deep reservoirs of confusion, sadness, and shame. And I also regularly subjected every woman I ever loved, including my current partner, to the inevitable suffering that comes with loving a man whose insatiable need for external success can drive him to pursue so-called opportunities that don't serve the relationship and may even outright harm it. Yet how could it have been any other way? I was living in the near complete absence of an elder man's voice reassuring me that I'm inherently a success in his eyes. No woman or accomplishment can ever substitute for the blessing into manhood that can only come from wiser elder men. It isn't an intimate partner's role to bestow upon a man the measure of his internal worth. It's an elder's guidance and praise that can put his mind at ease, whatever his circumstances. Even if that elder be dead or not his actual father, it's the praising, encouraging words of a trustable elder man's voice resounding through his head that can finally calm his otherwise restless spirit. And just a little side note here. You may find it curious, as I do, that the God of many modern religions, while generally seen as a loving father, nonetheless demands that his children daily prove their worthiness to be with him. And this same father will forever cast those who fail into some awful abyss of perpetual suffering. Doesn't that sound like our experience with a lot of our human fathers? Mm-hmm. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. You know, at age 38, I attended a weekend initiatory rite of passage experience for men. And shortly after arriving, I was led to a chair at the edge of a woods where I sat before a white-haired elder man I'd never met before. He looked me in the eyes and he said only these words. Welcome. We have been waiting for you a long time. Now, for all I knew of this mystery man, he could have been an absolute wreck of a human being. Nonetheless, I began to weep. His simple, heartfelt words were gently whispering to a great yearning in my soul. Whoever he be, this elder was giving witness to my profound exhaustion at carrying a terrible burden of aloneness for a lifetime. His words reassured me I was no longer alone, that I was being embraced, welcomed home, even though I'd never been to these woods before. This stranger man pierced me with a sentence I hadn't even known I needed to hear. My own father seems incapable of offering me this gift. We speak from time to time, and I know him as a good-hearted man, but I wouldn't even trust such words from his mouth. For I realized, or decided, long ago that he was simply as lost as a man as I was. He didn't grow up feeling supported and encouraged by men either. This is the essential, paradoxical role of father. The essential role of father in a child's life, particularly a boy's, is a paradox. He must challenge him such that he learns to stand his own ground and find his own place in the world, yet simultaneously also guide and reassure him such that he lives in the direction of ideals worthy of his heart, his being as a man. It's a delicate dance few of our fathers ever did well, and though I believe this is changing, Many of us are intimately familiar with the challenges laid down by a father or by other boys, men, through competition, comparison, comparison, criticism, which is why we endlessly strive to achieve, to win, to exploit the world around us, whatever the cost. In that world, winning is our only shot at safety. Few of us also regularly received reassurance and genuinely helpful wisdom from our fathers. Thus, we wear our masks of invincibility, insisting we know what we're doing, despite feeling painfully lost all the while. I believe humanity will be transformed by fathers learning to say more often to their children, whatever their gender, 
I love you. You are already a magnificent success in my eyes. For those of us men and women who are destined to live essentially without that voice in this lifetime, it falls upon us then to find that voice within ourselves all the same. To reparent ourselves, you might say. The crux of my own deepest, most difficult internal work for the last two decades has been switching on my own internal voice of reassurance and worthiness. By confronting my hidden range, this my hidden rage, my enduring sadness, I've allowed myself to grieve my absent father. Through years of inner mindset work, I've learned to overthrow the ignorant critic within when he rises to insist nothing I do is enough. I've finally initiated my own wise inner elder who daily reassures me I am a walking success. And my simple presence is the greatest gift I can ever give to anyone. I literally have these words on a, on a, like a pictograph next to my computer that I look at often. I am walking success and my presence is a gift to people. Hearing these words, even if only in my own head, calms me in a way little else ever can. And every man must discover for himself that there's no form of external success, not money, career, sex, relationship, that can fill the father-sized hole in his heart. He must undertake the inner journey of learning how to lift and fill himself up in ways that don't merely depend on his external circumstances. The depth and quality of his life and his relationships to others, to his intimate partner, and especially to himself, fully depends on it. <sighs> so here are my three key takeaways. Number one, the most important work we can ever do is work on our inner fragility. Remember that quote from Guy Cornell in the book, Absent Fathers, Lost Sons. The more fragile a man feels internally, the more likely he is to try building an outer shell to hide this fragility. How much damage do we do to ourselves and others, to the planet, in our endless, if mostly unconscious, attempts to hide our inner fragility with external measures of strength and success? I mean, it's everywhere, from the way we exploit and destroy the environment for our comforts and our toys, to all the ways a man might reject an intimate partner's upset with him because he doesn't have the inner fortitude to face his own dysfunctions, which if his relationship is to thrive, he needs to face. We see this inner fragility playing out painfully around us right now, particularly in the United States and our political leaders who can't make mistakes or who can't, I'm sorry, who can't admit to making mistakes even in police unions, unwilling to consider that there might be other ways to effectively serve hurting communities that don't just require more guns and more jails. And on and on and on. And I don't mean to make that a political statement. I'm not anti-police. I'm not anti any particular p politician. What I am for are men who are willing to introspect, men who are willing to examine the ways in which we are showing up in the world that does not serve ourselves and others, that does not serve our hearts, that does not serve our communities, that do not serve uh, so many of the people that we are hurting, even through our best of intentions. But we are serving because we are attempting to hide our inner fragility. So that's key takeaway number one. The most important work we can ever do is to work on our inner fragility. Key takeaway number two, the lack of deep masculine fulfillment, or in other words, the presence of painful inner fragility, destroys intimacy. I have yet to see an example of a man who could fully show up for love, for being a committed, sustained presence of love and support for his intimate partner or his family when he himself feels consistently empty inside, unable to value or love himself. That's not to say that we all need to learn how to fully love and accept ourselves before we can really show up for relationship or for love with another person. Of course not. We are all forever, endlessly, artworks in progress. And so much of our inner healing work will come in the intimate presence of another human being so close to us that they can't help 
but reflect back all that remains unhealed and hidden in our shadows within. But so long as we are not leaning into that work of healing our inner fragility or diligently committing ourselves to finding our inner fulfillment, then we will almost certainly project all that emptiness onto any intimate relationship and blame it or our partner for, uh, for our discontent. We'll even find plenty of evidence to agree with this ill-conceived conclusion. My partner, for example, my partner will get angry if I do this. My relationship limits me from doing that. My partner isn't this or that or whatever thing I think she or he needs to be to make me finally happy. And on and on and on. No intimate relationship can ever long soothe the awful ache of a man disconnected from his deepest purpose or unhealed in his inner fragility. Key takeaway number three. We must learn to reparent ourselves, to become the fathers to ourselves that many of us never had and never will have, and to say daily to ourselves that it's truly okay to fail, to not succeed in the ways we think we should, to struggle and stumble and fall down over and over again, and even to not win, and that it's okay, even healthy, to feel sadness and frustration and jealousy and grief and loss and everything else we might feel in the course of an average day in the life of a human being on this crazy planet. And it's good practice, good for a man, to get back up out of bed the next day and get back to doing our best all over again to live the day well and to support others in living the day well in ways that are meaningful to them. And whether or not we succeed today in the ways we think we should, we're already a success in our inner father's eyes. So thank you so much for listening. I trust this episode has served you well and stirred you well. You can find this episode, including a link to the subject blog and any other links, resources, books, show notes, etc., as well as other episodes featuring inspiring insights and conversations with extraordinary and wise guests at brianreeves.com slash menthiswaypodcast. It's Brian with a Y. Dot com slash, I'm sorry, Brian Reeves, B R Y A N Reeves dot com slash men this way podcast. And remember, as a men this way listener, you get 10% off of all of my relationship courses, including the boundaries program, relationships suck without boundaries, uh, as well as the love sex relationship magic program and my conflict to connection 90 day program, which I created with my Insta famous wife, <clears throat> of a relationship coach and therapist, Sylvie Kukasian. 10% off of everything at brianreeves.com using coupon code men this way 10 when you check out. And if you were served by this and think others should hear it too, please share this episode or just write a review so that you too can lead more men this way. And don't forget to subscribe yourself while you're at it. I'm your thriving life and relationship coach, Brian Reeves, Brian with the Y Reeves. Until soon, keep your head up, your breath relaxed, and your thoughts inspired.